afternoon to everybody. I'm Sarah Sukho. I'm from KI, or Trigger International Manitowoc, and um, chair of the Wellness Council here in Manitowoc County. And today, we're going to learn a little bit about um, skin cancer and identifying skin cancer from a very wellness perspective. Today, I have with me on Dr. Sue Kyler, the Neurotology Associate of Wisconsin. She'll be speaking about skin cancer, including examples of different types, the importance of early detection, and skin protection. She's a board certified dermatologist and fellowship trained pediatric dermatologist. And her professional areas of interest include specialized care, treatment of skin, hair, nail problems that affect children, including uh, pigmented birthmarks. I don't know how to say this word. Meningiomas. <laughs> sorry. Fort Weinstein's alopecia areta and atopic dermatitis. Dr. Tyler also takes interest in skin cancer diagnosis and treatment, treatment of acne. Rosacea, psoriasis, and eczema. It's going to be a medical you know, She's a member of the American Academy of Dermatology Society, Pediatric Dermatology, and American Medical Association. And just so all of you know, some of you are members of the Wellness Council, but also visit this, this Wellness Council we have in Manitowoc County is really designed to help um, employers with results oriented wellness programs. And the reason why we do get together is to share different practices ideas started um, probably late, well, almost a year ago and our goal again is to share practices so we don't have to the wheel. Um, it is a belief and commitment that um, we are an ongoing growing group. We really want to um, focus on awareness and education and many of the, uh, the facets of wellness we are looking at are the spiritual, the social, occupational, physical, intellectual, emotional, environmental, financial, mental, and medical. So, whole realm of wellness. People always think of, you know, working out, eating right. Well, there's a lot of areas, especially, for example, here that Dr. Um, Tyler is going to present that today. So, please um, join me in welcoming Dr. Tyler. Thank you very much. Um, how many people are in the healthcare field, or nutrition, or diet, or to get an idea? So, we'll discuss a little bit about skin cancer and also prevention. So skin cancer is actually the most common form of cancer in the United States, and it's actually increasing incidence, whereas a lot of the other cancers um, are decreasing. A person has a one in five chance of developing a skin cancer during their lifetime, and there's nearly two million new cases of skin cancer just in the uh, United States diagnosed and treated each year. So early uh, detection and treatment greatly increases the chance of cure, and also reduces the reduces the risk of scarring, uh, makes the scar look. So it can occur at any age. Of course, it is much more common in um, elderly or, or people over 40 to 50. Um, most common, that's, I'm not saying that those are elderly. <laughs> 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 I do get out wrong. So most um, commonly occurs on the face, especially in the nose and the ears, and it frequently doesn't hurt. So, um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be symptomatic at all. It's not to bleed or be itchy or anything. So risk factors, definitely blistering sunburns, multiple sunburns, Repeated sun or ultraviolet light exposures, whether that's outside or in tanning beds, and family history. Sun damage does stay forever, and it adds up each year, which I think this is the most important aspect. Most people actually get most of their sun damage during the first 20 years of life, especially during their childhood, first, you know, adolescence. Every single time you get exposed to the sun again, it just builds on itself, because you're getting individual damage to the cells each time, and eventually it kind of reaches its threshold and can't repair itself, and that's when you get the skin cancer. So it may take 20 to 30 years to present itself. So starting to get sunscreen use at any age will help. Um, definitely encouraging you know, children to start at a young age is the best. So ultraviolet radiation, which is the primary cause of most sun, uh, skin cancers, it's most intense during the midday, but occurs all day long. Most intense close to the equator, so Florida, Arizona. Um, it can come from the sun or from tanning beds, and it causes almost everything we call um, skin aging. The ozone layer actually functions to filter and block the ultraviolet radiation coming from the sun. It is estimated that for every 1% decrease in the ozone layer, there will be a 5 to 10% increase in the incidence of skin cancer. These are all the signs of different sun damage. You can get that dry, leathery type of look, multiple different pigmented spots that can either be 
light spots or dark spots, um, just uneven coloration, loss of elasticity, which results in increased wrinkling on the skin, um, brown spots. So I mentioned Sunday that it does add up, so you do not want to look like this, looking all leather and looking like a leather purse. So there's three main types of skin cancer, um, basal cell, squamous cell, and melanoma. Basal cell is definitely the most common in that by itself, typically there's over two a million diagnosed annually in the United States each year. Squamous cell is over 700,000 annually in the United States. Melanoma, which is the most scary one, um, it's the least common, but it's 60,000 still. Melanoma accounts for more than skin cancers, but 75% of all skin cancer deaths. One person dies every hour in the United States from melanoma. So first starting with basal cell, it is the most common form and accounts for 80% of all skin cancers. Uh, most common places are under the ears, uh, the nose, and pretty much anywhere on the face. Typically it presents as a pearly, kind of pink or flesh colored bump. A lot of times you'll see the little overlying little blood vessels on the surface. It can also though sometimes present as more of a scaly, non-healing patch. Um, it has typically a little bit raised edges, so you usually will feel something. Um, some people can get small yellowish or slightly bloody crust from it. Um, you can also think of it as a pimple that doesn't heal. So if it's been there for over a month, most pimples can resolve by a month, definitely by two months. Um, so if it's not going away, then it probably should be something that you can get like that. Just another example, kind of that pink, um, kind of pink bump. It has little blood vessels on the surface. Another thing is these grow actually very slowly. These are the least aggressive, which is great, but you do want to catch them earlier so that the scar is the smallest so they can be. So as I mentioned, more locally destructive, very slow growing. Um, this, unlike the other ones that we're going to discuss, typically does not ever spread anywhere else in your body. People typically are not going to die of a basal cell. However, there is probably one or two people that I do know who will, and it's just because it's gotten so locally destructive in that area that they'll probably die from bleeding resulting from it because of the sensitive area on the face. Um, and it's almost always bigger than it looks, which you'll see later on I have some pictures. So again, just one example. Also again, it can be more just crusty, kind of not healing. Most of the time, it's going to be that pearly pink bump with overlying little blood vessels. Actinic keratoses, these are actually precancer spots. They appear as dry, scaly red spots. You can typically feel them, sometimes even better than see them. Um, they can come and go, and then eventually they kind of just persist and then they'll stay around. Um, these will potentially turn into a squamous cell, so they're precancer to a squamous cell, not basal cell. They occur mostly, again, on the face, ears, hands. Um, where you're going to get most of the sun um, exposure. They do not itch, usually bleed or hurt. If they're left untreated, about 1 in 10 will evolve eventually into a squamous cell uh, carcinoma. They're very easily treated. We treat them you know, typically with uh, liquid nitrogen, which is a little freezing spray. Um, there's also some prescription <coughs> chemotherapy creams that can also treat them. Um, those creams are best used more in the fall winter just because they're very light sensitive and can make you, it can be unpleasant. You get a lot of crusty, oozing, um, inflammation there for a good two weeks while you're on the treatment. And you really need to keep it protected, otherwise that just, that inflammation increases further. So usually we don't use the cream unless there's a lot of precancer spots that we're trying to do more of a field treatment for the whole area. Um, and usually wait to do that in the fall or winter. Squamous cell carcinoma is the second most common type of skin cancer. It accounts for 15% of all skin cancers. Typically, also, again, it can be just that scaly, non-healing bump. Um, it can be crusted. This one will potentially bleed with minor trauma, but it doesn't always have to. Um, typically, does not hurt. Again, typically, sun-exposed areas are going to be the most affected. Face, arms, legs, um, trunk if you get a lot of sun right there. 40 to 60 percent begin as actinic keratosis, so they begin as those precancer spots. So definitely, if we can catch them early, then you don't ever have to have a surgery or biopsy. We just freeze them and it's done. 
Um, it's definitely more dangerous if these occur on the lips, um, the ears, or within burn scars or other surgical scars. Just because they tend to be more aggressive, they tend to spread quicker. Um, for lips, smoking definitely can increase the risk of getting these. Um, you can also get them inside the mouth as well. And some just more examples. These are, again, more firm, kind of scaly bumps. Basal cells tend to be a little more soft. Um, these can be pretty hard. Her crusty plaque is just not going away. They've been there for, for over you know, a month. Um, another example on her cheek. I see several of those kind of pink dusty skinny spots. So they can, they're locally aggressive as well, um, but if untreated, these can also spread to other areas of the body. Um, so they can uh, be fatal. There's about 3,000 deaths a year from uh, skin swing cell carcinoma. So for these non-melanoma skin cancers, the basal cells, the squamous cells, a lot of times what you see at the surface is only the tip of the iceberg, and then this cancer is actually deeper, spread out a little bit more underneath the surface of the skin. And I'll show you why this is important later. But as you can see, this gentleman, he has just a small little spot on the upper lip, but after a specialized surgery we took over later, they noticed it actually involved that whole area. So again, better, and most of the time it's not that, that bad. It's usually smaller, but occasionally, especially if it's something where you did fine that surgery, because you did the biopsy, you felt it took it away, the skin's healing up. This is one reason we kind of caution people to make sure it's all gone. If the surgery, make sure the margins are all gone, because biopsies don't check the whole margin. Biopsies are really just there to diagnose what kind of skin cancer it is. Um, they're not looking at the whole size of it or the underneath surface because um, they have they kind of the thread loafing pattern so they're cutting certain parts but they're not seeing everything um, so if there is still some skin cancer left sometimes it'll grow deeper underneath the skin and not appear on the surface until many years later and then when it does appear then it'll be a lot bigger so this is most likely the case for this gentleman and then Melanomas, these are definitely the most dangerous type of skin cancer. One in six people develop one in their lifetime. Um, I've, I've read different reports, one in 60 to one in 75. Um, definitely the rate of melanoma is increasing faster than any other uh, skin cancer. And we're seeing these a lot um, more frequently in younger individuals. So it's the number one cause of cancer death in women aged 25 and 30. 20 to 40 percent typically arise in pre-existing moles um, that you have already on your body. 60 to 80 percent arise from normal skin. So I always say it's a good thing to just look at your own skin about once a month, kind of get an idea of what your you know moles look like. You know when you're doing your breast exam is a great time to kind of just look at the moles too to get in that habit. If you notice that there's a new spot that wasn't there, especially if it's really dark in color or if one of your moles is kind of growing outwards. Um, then it's probably best to have it examined. <laughs> now people can get new moles up until about age 25, 30, but after age 30, you shouldn't really be getting new moles. You can get a few little freckle sunspots, but not like that brown, classic, um, symmetric spots. And then the most common places is actually the legs in women and the back in men. So this is just showing that the lifetime risk has been increasing dramatically over the years. In 1930, it was about one in 1,500 would get a melanoma, but now again, it's about 1 in 60, 1 in 75. So when we think about melanoma and things to look out for for your moles, we said the ABCDs, and recently they actually added an E to that. Um, so A would be asymmetry. If there's part of it, you can't put a line right through the middle um, and, and fold it over on oneself. If the border is irregular, uh, if you have a little Mickey, I used to say a little Mickey Mouse ear, developing off one end of it, that would be concerning. Um, and color, especially black. Most, some people do have darker moles, but if you are someone who typically doesn't, um, most of the individuals in this room, they should kind of should. It's really if you have really darker pigmented like, skin to begin with, that you might have a black or mole and that's your normal mole. Um, or if any of your moles are like multiple different colors, if there's lighter spots and darker spots, um, then that would be worrisome, or red spots would be worrisome too. Diameter is not as concerning to me because um, 
some people do, they're born with a little bit larger moles. Um, so they used to have a six millimeter as a cutoff. It's more that if it's growing. Your moles can grow upward over time. They can also lose their pigment, so they can turn more skin color over time. But they should not be growing outward. Once you've kind of reached your maximum height, your moles should not be growing anymore. And obviously they should never be painful, bleeding, even itching. Most of the things, um, insurance now is not covering some if it is removal or treatment of some conditions if they're itchy. But if you have an itchy mole, that could be concerning. I have had some people who were diagnosed a melanoma. I didn't actually look that concerning, but it was very itchy to them. So we took it off and it was concerning. So, And then of course, any mole that looks different from all the other ones. We say the ugly duckling mole, if there's one that just doesn't belong. So definitely knowing your risk factors can raise your awareness and need for earlier detection. Um, definitely better when it's treated um, properly and treated early. If, if, and if you look at melanoma um, by the depth, how deep it is, um, so if it penetrates less than one millimeters into the skin, then the survival rate is very good. It's over 90%, actually reaching more 95 to 100%. But if it penetrates more than four millimeters, which is not that much more, um, really two to three individuals, two and three individuals will die within five years. Um, and really, once it actually goes above one millimeter, that's when we can't just even surgically excise it in the office anymore. We would then, they might want to check their lymph nodes um, and do biopsies with that, make sure it hasn't spread anywhere further. I would say that the majority of people that we see and they get, we diagnose, they tend to be what we call melanoma in situ, which is the earliest form of melanoma you can get. It's just localized just in the skin, and there's no depth to it at all. Not, you know, survival rate is approaching 100% with that. Um, so that's definitely the, the best time you want to get it removed and treated. So again, you can see in this lesion, very dark in color. The middle part is more light in color and more white. Uh, so it's even lighter than the surrounding skin. That's what actually worries inside just as much as the, the black area is. Um, over time in melanomas, we, that white area is what we call regression. That's when the pigment starts dropping down deeper into the skin, and then you lose that pigment in that area. So that can be a worry. Again, this is actually on the bottom of a foot. You can see the multiple different colors there. Um, kind of irregular in shape, doesn't have a discrete border to it. Again, more irregular. Um, the center part is a little bit darker. Um, and then there's atypical moles, or what we call dysplastic moles. These are moles that have some kind of worrisome features, um, but definitely are not cancer at that point. Um, so, if you have dysplastic moles, um, with no personal or family history of melanoma, you have a 7 to 27 time, you know, increased risk of developing melanoma. So definitely people who have had atypical moles, we do follow more closely just because they're more apt to develop more atypical um, lesions. So same things that apply for these, it's just not as, you know, stark or contrasted, but again, asymmetry, irregular border, color, it's just not as so if you have just one atypical mole or just plastic mole, it increases your risk by about one six or one point six times. Um, five or more given ten percent increased risk. Um, Twenty percent of melanoma, as I mentioned before, arise from an atypical mole, and it's strongly related. Um, your risk is strongly related to the number of atypical moles you have. Positive family history, really first degree family members brothers, sisters, mother, father, children, if any of them have a history of melanoma, it increases your risk. It says here 5%, but I've also read up to kind of doubling your risk. So if it's a 1 in 60, 1 in 75 risk for most people, it could drop it really to 1 in 35. Um, if you have a personal history of melanoma, you're more apt to potentially get another one. That's also why we, we see them back on a regular basis um, after being diagnosed. Again, if you live in an area where you're going to get more intense ultraviolet radiation, um, Hawaii versus Wisconsin, then you're going to be at increased risk too. If you have a suppressed immune system, so your body can't fight off, you know, um, or skin, you know, atypical um, findings and skin damage, um, then your risk is going to be higher. So organ transplant patients, HIV, certain medications can suppress your immune system, especially prednisone is a common one. Um, 
cancer by itself can in an increasing age. Other risk factors include blistering sunburns as a child or a teenager or even as an adult. Um, inability to tan more that you have very fair skin, blonde hair, blue eyes, or red hair. Um, you're going to burn more than you're going to tan, and so you're going to have even higher kind of sun damage. You have a lot of freckles. Um, Obviously, ultraviolet light exposure. Tanning beds actually increase your risk by 75%. We're seeing kid, you know, teenagers, early 20-year-olds getting diagnosed with melanomas, and they all have a history of tanning bed use. Um, several, one thing that's interesting is more um, basal cell squamous cells are really from that chronic sun exposure over the years, whereas melanoma is more that intermittent sun exposure, high intensity intermittent. Um, they always used to link it to like. Um, dentist wives and they would go to on vacation several times a year in really warm areas and they'd always get burned. They were at more risk than people who might have more regular sun exposure throughout the years, even though that still causes a lot of damage to your skin. So different preventative, um, definitely wearing sunscreen and say at least a 30 to a 50. There's a lot that are on the market now that goes up to you know, 80, 100. Really that's just adding a lot more chemicals um, than really adding too much to the protection. An SPF of 30 will protect against about 95% of sun rays. When you go up to like 8,500, you're getting maybe 2% better protection, but you are adding a lot more chemicals to, you, to your skin. I think the main problem is people don't put enough on. You really should use a good ounce and a half to your, if you're going to be applying it to your whole body um, if you weren't a swimsuit. And you want to reapply every hour and a half to two hours if you're going to be outside. Um, definitely wearing sun protective clothing can help. Those swimmer sh surfer shirts are great for little kids, widebred cats, um, and again, acute inner both any type of sun damage is bad. Um, some people I know will also want to try to get a base tan before going on vacation. That's causing some damage too. You're less likely than maybe to burn by having a little bit extra pigment in your skin, but it's still causing damage. Um, so you're increasing your risk while you're doing that. You want to try to avoid midday sun to be between 10 and 3 um, when the ultraviolet light is most intense. Also, people, um, it's best if you also wear sunscreen even in the winter months to your face because the sun is shining all year round, even on rainy, cloudy days, there is some sun because it's light out. Um, so you can, it adds up over time. Some um, ultraviolet radiation, it really, you have ultraviolet A and ultraviolet B radiation, and it can penetrate through um, window glass too, so it's hard. Uh, so even you're not necessarily safe if you're going to just stay inside if you're near a window, you're still going to get some damage. Definitely if you have any spots that you're worried about, it's always better to be safe and to see someone for an exam. Um, be alert to any changes in your skin. Examine your significant other skin, especially their backs where it's hard for them to see. Um, just try to be proactive too. Not everything though that you see is necessarily bad. So I guess a lot of people coming in, they're worried about a very thick black you know, lesion on their skin. Very worried and they delayed seeking, you know, and, and thoughts on it because they're worried that it is a skin cancer and they're worried about what's going to happen. And it's a benign, completely benign growth, not worrisome. Um, but it's something called a separate keratosis that can sometimes mimic kind of atypical looking molds. But it's much better to know. You don't want to delay it for years because treatment would be more difficult if it happened to be something bad. Or you could have reassurance that it's perfectly fine and you don't have to worry about it. Um, so this is, again, why we need to treat skin cancer early. I'm going to talk a little bit about one procedure that we use a lot for the face. Um, face, neck, scalp, where we don't have as much uh, normal uh, skin. So we want to minimize the amount that we have to take when we do these procedures. So most micrographic surgery was actually developed in Wisconsin. It's now used throughout the country um, in 1930 by Frederick Rose. It's performed by most surgeons. So it's a special <coughs> fellowship training that they do. They have extra training in this procedure and in facial reconstructive surgery. Um, so that's a year after they do regular dermatology. It's a systematic method of removing skin cancer one layer at a time. It allows a surgeon to selectively remove the cancer by sparing the normal surrounding skin, thereby taking the least amount necessary. Um, all other forms of treatment uh, involve
about removing a margin of normal skin to, to, hope, to increase the chances that we get it all the first time and we don't have to go back and paint more. So unlike the arms, the legs, and chunk where you have a lot more extra skin, this sur surgery for most cases are, is not going to be a, covered by insurance um, unless there's certain more aggressive features to that skin cancer. But for the face, neck, scalp, it's a great procedure. Um, so most effective methods for, of treatment for basal and squamous cell carcinomas has cure rates of over 99% um, versus a cure rate of maybe 90 to 95% for a standard incision and the scar is a lot smaller. Did you say the most procedure is generally not covered by insurance? It's, it's, covered, it's typically covered by insurance if it is on the face, the neck, the scalp, actually the, the front of, there's a, the hands and the feet, if you have less skin there, the um, front of your shins. Sometimes in some people it's really tight, so it could be covered there. And then there's a few, with the basal cells, there's actually six different subtypes of basal cells on um, skin cancers. There's a few of them that are just a little bit, they tend to have more little tentacles that spread out further. So for those, we also do it. They're not any more really aggressive, but it's just harder to get them all out by taking a standard incision. Um, so it's better to kind of take it one layer at a time, make sure you're getting it all. Um, so how it works is that you have your tumor, they go down and they take a thin little layer around that whole area. Um, then they mount it on a slide, they prepare it while you're waiting. It takes about 30, 40 minutes to prepare it. Then they examine it, see if there's any skin cancer left. They're, they are looking at the entire margin, so they're looking at the whole area around as well as the deep margin underneath. So they can see if there's any skin cancer left where it's and where it's located. This kind of gives a good picture of the pre-op where they came in, they already had a biopsy, so that little whiter area is where the biopsy was done. There's still a little bit of pink redness, so that's likely also skin cancer, so they're going to go right around that whole area. For stage one, when they looked under the microscope, they saw that there was still skin cancer, represented, which is being represented by those little yellow dots. Um, is still being on that area. So when they go back and take another little layer, they're only going back and taking it in, in that section. They're leaving the top alone because that was all gone. For the stage two, they're still a little bit in that section three. So they go back and take just a little bit more there. And then by stage three, there's no additional. I must say most of the time, they're usually removed in one or two stages. It's rare that it has to go more, but especially if it's more of a recurrent skin cancer or one that you've had for a lot longer, um, bigger ones, then we usually need this. Okay. Usually you can go past that. So you can see the defect and then it's closed up <coughs> and by probably three months later, the scar is well healed. Also on the ear, there's a big portion that had to be removed but because most surgeons are kind of trained also in facial reconstructive surgery, um, they really have the same techniques that plastic surgeons do, so they can close it up and it heals really well. And again, on the, on the nose, relatively wide defect, but they're able to do some grafting and make it so that you can still see a little bit where the scar is, but not too bad.
12 different topics. I think a lot of them are pretty good. If you're looking at your whole body, um, I think a lot of them are pretty good. We get a lot of referrals if they're worried about certain spots. But if you have a specific spot that you're really concerned about, you know, and, and if you mention it to them and they're not, you know, if they're not sure or they have questions, a lot of times they'll refer anyways, but if you're not 100% comfortable, then just have it looked at. And it's good to be looked at all over because some people only want their face or their arms looked at, but you really can't get skin cancer anywhere. And not even maybe not the basal cells, the squamous cells, because those will occur more in sun-exposed areas. And if you never wore a bikini and you were always very good about protecting yourself, um, but melanoma, you do get seen them on the bottom of the foot, which doesn't get sun exposure because that's more hereditary. It's a combination of hereditary and sun. Well, this is the lady, um, we were having dermatology, so she actually came in and she was screaming on the site for us yeah. in July, yes. um, mid July, for our employees for a couple hours, and then they can be referred to. Uh, so that's something you'll do more of in the community. We really, yeah, our goal is to, well, it's the education game, is that was I don't think we need to see it. But um, you do that more of an outreach or more? We, um, we do. We, we always contact our marketing group. Um, we're always eager to go out to workplaces and set these up. And we usually have at least once or twice a year free skin cancer screenings in the office, usually on a Saturday morning. Um, the one thing is because we are getting so many requests that we're going to be probably putting a little limitation on the hours or like, like we're more than willing, I know me and my colleague are more than willing to do it on weekends or evenings, you know, some. It's just when it gets to be so many during the day, we won't be able to see the a lot of patients too. But yeah, we're more than eager to, to come out from volunteer day. So I was going to say, you, what is the cost for something like that? If you go to a work site for a two-hour block of time, I don't think we, we don't charge anything. Yeah, it's all right. Do like ten-minute appointments or something? Yeah. And
two different products. They tend not to react to those as much. Um, also really good for children. Is anything over the 30 kind of a waste of? I would say 30 to 50. Because okay. I think when my husband went for a checkup, yeah. the doctor said <coughs> anything over 30 is just a waste of money. Pretty, yeah, Sorry. 30 to 50 if they anything else. If it's more expensive, yeah. A lot of the um, ones that have more physical blockers are in that range of 30 to 50 too. Um, you would argue a lot more chemicals when you go up. Do you really need to toss your sunscreen every year? There should be, actually sunscreens are, I was reading up on this, they, they should be good for three years. However, you shouldn't have sunscreen for past in the summer. Like, you shouldn't have used it all by the end of the time. <laughs> As if people aren't using it all of it. Um, but look, there should be an expiration date, and they tend to put them on a little crease at the top, or if it's like a aerosol, it'll be on the bottom of the can. So I wouldn't use it past the expiration date. Definitely sunscreens, more than lotions and everything else, can expire, and it tends to lose its consistency. <coughs> it's very like, watery and separates, and then it gets not pleasant. Just one other question, this uh, lifetime risk increasing so much, is, is that a big part attributed to the ozone layer, or is that other? I think that with candy bed use, um, people are living longer, so that definitely increases it because the elderly definitely have more sun or skin cancers. But even in adolescents, even though people are outreaching to them more, seeing how bad candy beds are, they're still increasing in incidence, and people are still trying to get tan because that's the end thing. Spray tans are perfectly fine. There's no risk with um, spray tans. The only thing is there's different ways they can, um, you can have someone spray you, uh, or you can step into a booth and get sprayed. If you step into the booth one, it kind of comes at you in all directions. I haven't, I've heard, I haven't actually been in that one, and you don't want to breathe it in, because then it can be bad for other words. But. Been a radio ball with them. PD cream and CC cream as a it's, it's like a lotion that be like a foundation, but it's got sunscreen in it. Yes. Do you know anything about that? Is it is it just a, a new hype for the cosmetic industry, or is there really some value in it? I it's supposed to reduce wrinkles. The wrinkles too. A lot. I'm not sure about that one particular one. I do know a lot of foundations and stuff are trying to put some sunscreen in, but usually it's like an SPF of like 10 or 15. Um, <coughs> a lot of them, if it's for wrinkles, they'll have some type of retinoid in it, uh, which is, there's stronger ones available by prescription, but they, it takes a long time to see results. So. One other thing about sunscreen is a lot of parents really like aerosols, um, the spray ones, which it's fine. The only thing is a lot of times I feel like areas are being missed because you don't see exactly where it's being um, apply. So you just have to be really good about really spraying on extra. Or I also have mentioned apply the cream first for like the initial one, and then if you're going to be outside for a long time, and then bring the aerosol and do that as the subsequent ones. So. You had mentioned that they would contact the laundry department, but that's like Stephanie. Oh, I contacted. Or call them off So they could just ask for the marketing department? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Do you have it? Um, I don't have the number on me, but I'll be sending out a survey to everyone who attended today, okay. and I'll um, put the contact information there in case anyone would like to contact your office. I'll do that today. Stephanie would usually be finished. Yeah. the contact information for Dermatology Associates in case you're interested in having them come to your company um, when I send out the survey today, so watch for that. And we're done early. It's like a bonus today. We started a little early. We got done early. So, and we're done. Thank you so much for coming. We really Thank you. Even lunchtime, we could probably do it. Okay. Thanks.
Yo me Oh, yeah. 